Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again to another episode of Revealing God. Uh, you may notice that since we last saw each other, somebody got his hair cut. It was way overdue, so you're welcome. Anyways, uh, this is an exciting episode today. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the science. Obviously, we can't get too deep into it because there is so much diving in that you could do and so much research that you could do about the science about Jesus Christ and that God exists and and all that. But I do have uh, two pieces that I want to show you today. The first one is from CBNnews.com. And the second one is from Melissa at uh, freedomforce.live. Uh, first one is just a general scientific evidence about Jesus Christ. And the second one is what I alluded to in the first episode or the, uh, sorry, the first part of this episode. Anyways, um, before this gets too long, I'm just going to jump right into it. Alex McFarland is a leading Christian apologist. If you're wondering, that doesn't mean he apologizes for the faith. It means he defends Christ's history and shows why you can trust it. To get there, he first explains what historians want. They want eyewitness testimony. They want multiple testimony. They, they want early testimony. And the fourth is hostile testimony. As for eyewitness and early, the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are by men who either knew Jesus in the flesh or got their facts from eyewitnesses, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. Paul's epistles are written by a man who encountered the resurrected Christ. We have got the Gospels coming to us from less than 10 years after the cross. Compare that to the 643 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad, whose authenticity scholars don't question. But from the time of the writing to the copies, we have more than 500 years, in fact, around 900 years. We've got the Annals of Caesar, which comes to us in several dozen copies. But again, from the earliest copies we have, the time of writing, nearly a millennium, a thousand years. Compare that to the main facts about Christ. The core of Jesus' identity message credentials was in circulation regularly within eight weeks after the cross. As for hostile testimony, or at least not pro-Christian, Many outside sources wrote of this Jesus. A worker of wonders did miracles, claimed to be God, crucified at Passover. The core facts of the gospel, death, deity, and resurrection, just based on ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources that certainly were no friend to the burgeoning church. That's very compelling to historians because it represents objectivity, that those no friend of the movement also corroborate the core facts of what we know about Jesus. Will Durant, an atheist most of his life, but possibly the world's most trusted historian, testified this. The four gospels are absolutely trustworthy from an historical standpoint. Durant would say, if you reject those. We would also have to reject a hundred other ancient names, the authenticity of which no historian would dream of questioning. Uh, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, people that we don't have as much evidence for as we do for Jesus. Filmmaker Rick Larson finds proof of Christ and the miraculous world around him in a whole different sphere, scientific evidence. There are two great events in Christianity. There's the incarnation and there's the execution and resurrection. That's Those are the two great events. And those two things God chose to you leave hard evidence that we can find today <laughs> and show that they occurred. In the Star of Bethlehem documentary, Larson found there really was a light in the heavens that guided the wise men to baby Jesus. It was even shown on coins made at the time. The Christquake shows how Larson's crew found in ground, once covered by the Dead Sea, the geologic ripples of the gigantic earthquake that split rocks at the very hour of Jesus' death. It all proves to Larson who God is. The two documentaries show that the star of Bethlehem was real, that's the heavens, and that the quake at the cross was real. So he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he chose to leave enough evidence for us to see those things are true. The Gospel of Matthew described both the star and quake. And for both the star of Bethlehem and for the quake at the cross, the facts we find, scientific, hard science, hard scientific facts we find are consistent with the record in Matthew. As for the written record, remember those hundreds of ancient copies of Homer's Iliad or the dozens of Caesar's biographies? Well, many more manuscripts of the New Testament exist. 
fragments, portions, complete New Testaments, roughly 30,000 copies. And even if we didn't have those? We could reconstruct verbatim the entire New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, just based on more than a half million verse citations by early church leaders that have been discovered. The trustworthy history in the New Testament finally brought the atheist master historian Durant around. It is said that Durant became a Christian before he died because he was compelled by the historicity of Jesus. McFarland's conclusion, a believer does need faith in Christ. But it's a faith validated and worthy of our trust, our following, and our obedience. Jesus is real. He did, and he did. And so Ron knew that he was on to something. He was on to the real deal. So they dug and dug and dug. And so when he went through this narrow passage, when he got into this area, he was, at first he saw just a bunch of rocks and they were movable. And then underneath the rocks, there was some wood and underneath that there were animal skins. So he realized he was on a table. So then he kept crawling, crawling, crawling over. Of course, it's dark and he has a flashlight. It's not easy to see. And then he goes a little farther and he sees this big box. And so he, it's got stone on top of it. And actually the top of the stone is actually broken. And so he put his flashlight down in there and he could tell he could see gold. And so he knew he'd found it. Well, he, he completely fell out over just realizing what he had, what he was seeing. Um, and of course, because he's, he's a man of God, he's a true man of God. He, the Lord did not, <laughs> nothing happened to him. He's fine, but he was, he fell out and then he woke back up. He came back to, and, um, uh, he went back out. He tried to get a camera to take some pictures and none of the pictures would come out. Just real blurry. You can see that on the video. They're real blurry. Um, so then on another time that he went in there, he was able to look in through that crack and he could see that there was blood on the left side of the ark. And the significance of that is huge. Remember how I told you they only put the blood on the right side of the ark. What's blood doing on the left side of the ark? So he looked up and he saw there was a crack above him, right above that crack on the ark, on the stone that was covering the ark of the covenant. And so now he has taken a scope all the way up that crack and there's blood all up that crack. And you go all the way up 20 feet up and you will see there is the exact place where they had put the cross. So what must have happened was, and we know this by the accounts in the word, is that when Jesus died on the cross, his the contents of his blood went into his abdominal cavity. It just poured into his abdominal cavity because he literally died. He didn't die of asphyxiation. That's what normally crucifixion victims would die of. So our Lord Jesus did not die of asphyxiation. He actually died of a broken heart. His heart literally burst. What he was enduring was so excruciating that it literally broke his heart. Um, I think that we can all relate a little bit to that in that whenever we've had something really, really sad happen, our heart literally aches. And so if you can imagine bearing the sins of all of humanity on your shoulders, taking the, the punishment for that, as well as being separated 
from your father at that time. It's just, it was more than his heart could take literally. So then the, if you remember the centurion ordered the soldier to come and pierce through Jesus. Well, it went likely, you know, it went into his abdominal cavity through his spleen and it, it the Bible says that the contents of his, uh, of his blood just poured out water and blood. Okay. So a lot, a lot of blood. Okay. Just, and it had been in there and now it's just, just pouring out. So then it says there was a great earthquake. So what they figure had to have happened was that, and I'll show you a picture on the screen, that crack there is where the earthquake was right beside where Jesus was crucified. And so the earth literally opened up and the Ark of the Covenant was 20 feet below. The blood went into the crack and went onto the left side of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. It's amazing. This is not, this is obviously easy for the Lord, but this is this is amazing. And it's exactly what Daniel was told in Daniel chapter nine, verse 24. He said, um, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. So he'd done all those things, right? He's done all those things for us. He's he's finished the transgressions. He's ended sins. Not only has he made us righteous in God's sight, he's also transformed us so that we don't live a life of sin anymore. He's he's at the cross. He did that. He accomplished that so that we have the power to do what he has told us to do, right? To seal up vision and prophecy. So all these things have been pointed to for years and years and years, and it was completed at the cross and to anoint the most holy. How amazing is that? Daniel said he was going to anoint the most holy. And so for us, for us, we might not recognize the importance of that, but back all for thousands of years, the blood had to go on the mercy seat. It can't just be something you think of that will happen. It actually physically has to go on the mercy seat. That's the whole point of the mercy seat on the top uh, of the Ark of the Covenant. The blood has to be there so that it shows a payment was made. And so all these years, I didn't really know, you know, that how exactly that was supposed to happen because no one even knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. You know, one can put anything on the mercy seat because the Ark of the Covenant wouldn't even have it to put the blood on. Even if someone were to say, we want to put Jesus's blood on there. But the Lord had it already planned. The Lord had it planned 600 years before when Jeremiah hid it there. Isn't that amazing? The Lord knows the end from the beginning. He has it all planned out. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. So where, where is it now? Well, it's still in there. Ron Wyatt tells the story that, that it's not time to take it out yet. It's coming close. But the thing is, what do you do with such a thing? And it has to be, you know, especially because it is dangerous and you don't take it out until the Lord says, and it's going to all come out in exactly the proper time and in the proper way. But now we know where it is and the authorities know where it is too. The Israeli authorities know where it is too, but are you going to want to move it? <laughs> right? Even Ron Wyatt was not going to move it out of there. And he re realized that this was not something he was supposed to do. He actually had the blood tested. I'm not a chemist, but he had it taken to the really high quality um, lab there in Israel and he didn't tell them where he got this blood he just wanted them to test it for him and they said that it only had one male chromosome 
they're like they couldn't they said who's is this and ron said that is the blood of your messiah it's too amazing so they said the blood is actually alive when we die our blood dies right but not this blood we've talked about that we've sung thousands of songs about that how amazing the blood of jesus is oh the blood of jesus it washes white as snow we sung about that and look at this it really does it really it's alive it's amazing it's amazing so i wanted to share that with you guys and i i feel yeah you can see why i've just felt unworthy to share this but i had to once i found out about it all right well hopefully you enjoyed those i know i did um it's pretty pretty impressive how god works through not only the miracles that he performs but how he performs them um and just uh just the incredible way that he could go about bringing things into reality i mean you could not you could not um probably dream that up and i don't think any human could uh potentially well i know they couldn't they wouldn't know where christ would be uh crucified and there would be an earthquake and, and all that. So it's just, it just speaks to God's incredible nature. And anyways, so yes, we are to have faith in God, right? And it doesn't have to be blind faith. Um, there, if you open your eyes, the world is filled with evidence of God and of Jesus's love for you absolutely everywhere and he's left little breadcrumbs along the way for us to find in order to further strengthen our confidence that god is real anyways let's pray real quick before we go <clears throat> lord we thank you for this day god and i thank you for everyone that's watching this video lord god we pray for our country we pray for this world lord Evil has been in control for a long time. But Lord, we know that you are the one that's in absolute control. And in heaven, you've already, you've already been the victor in this battle between good and evil. The victory is already won. And nobody can deny that, God. And so we thank you for the victory that you have given us over the evil that is running rampant in our world right now, Lord. And we wait patiently and excitedly for the revelation of your victory that's coming soon, God. The evidence is everywhere and we see it, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who um, don't know you, God, that they, that they get to know you. And Lord, we pray that people open their eyes to see what's actually going on in the world. Take off the blinders, God. Remove the scales from their eyes so that they can see. Not only is this a, a physical battle here on earth that's going on, but it's mostly a spiritual battle, God. And for those of us who have faith and believe, Lord, it's a battle that we've already won. So we thank you for that. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Have a good one.